and welcome back to Meeting of the Minds. Today I'm here with the great Father Phil Tangora. Father Phil, thank you for joining us. It's good to be with you and your audience. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so this is, like I said before, a long overdue conversation. We have our family connections. You're connected to my family. I'm connected to your family. Yes. So it's great to finally meet. <laughs> absolutely, yes. Yes, through, through cousins and relatives and all this. Yes, it is. It is nice to finally meet. Yeah, definitely. So now I was, I was intrigued. So you have two doctorates. No, no licentiates. Licentiates. Okay. Yeah. And they're in canon law and dogmatic theology. Yes. Yes. So the way that the church goes about things is a little bit different from the way you would say, uh, if you were a medical doctor or a lawyer, uh, a civil lawyer, so you would get the doctorate and then you get a license that is the specialization. We get the license and then after that is the doctorate for those who are going to wind up teaching uh, the profession. Uh, okay. Yeah. So are, you plan are you planning on teaching or do you already teach? Uh, I do teach from time to time on like a, as a guest uh, to different faculty or whatever. But for the most part, my job is to work in the tribunal here in the Diocese of Patterson and to be the pastor of a parish here in Branchville, Our Lady Queen of Peace. Excellent, excellent. And that's where my cousins go? Or they go nearby? Uh, no, they're, they, uh, they're out on uh, the island. Okay, no, no, my, my yeah. cousins. Oh, your cousins. Yeah, no, yeah, your cousins are, um, they're, yeah, not, they're, they're, they're here. Yeah, okay. they're, yeah. yeah. That's, that's great. So now I, I think I just heard the other day, I just, I just read, or I watched a YouTube video speaking about the, the priests had to wear a Beretta. So if, if you have your doctorate, you could wear a four winged Beretta as opposed to a three wing ring. That's uh, right. Ring. That's true. Yes. Yes. And, and it, it, it is true. Yes, that is true. That's a little fun fact. Uh, yeah. And you, then you also, you, your, the piping on the Beretta is of that academic degree. So ah. degrees in theology and canon law are the, uh, the scarlet red. <clears throat> oh, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. So, so many beautiful traditions that we're just not aware of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So we'll jump into it. So Father Phil, explain to us how canon law works. Is that the same as positive law? I think I've heard the neg negative law and positive law. Do I have that mixed up? Okay. Well, I don't know exactly what you mean by negative law and positive law. Positive law is any law that actually is promulgated by a just authority and then ha takes effect and has force of law. So it's been posited. So it's positive. It exists. And it, all right. Uh, it's plus one, not, you know. Uh, so any law, whether it's canon law or a civil law, uh, is going to be positive law because it's promulgated by just authority and takes effect after a certain period of vacatio legis. So vacatio legis is the time between it's being made known and when it takes force. All okay. right. So typically you don't have laws take force the day they're promulgated. They tend to take force a couple of, uh, whether it's weeks, months, or whatever afterwards, which is based off of allowing the fact to let the people know that the law exists and this is what now needs to be done. Okay. So, you know, so okay, canon law, canon law is the law of the church. Okay. And then you have civil law, uh, which is the law of civil societies. All right. Now you used to have what was called the use commune, the common law, common law, actually refers to the fact that both canon and civil law were of the same one larger corpus of law, okay? Up until uh, the different uh, separations of church and state that occurred at the time of the uh, Renaissance, you would have had a singular body of law that was uh, the use commune, the common law of both church and society, civil society. All right. And that's why there was no separation of church and state in a lot of ways in that regard. So what you 
what we have now as canon law is the inherited legal system that actually goes back to Roman law. So ecclesiastical jurisprudence goes back 2,000 years before Christ to the Roman Senate and to uh, the great jurists developing during the uh, Republic, the Roman Republic. Then you have the Roman Empire, and then you have the church in, in Rome, and you have where you have that common body of law that was codified by Justinian in Justinian's code. And then you have, and, and, and that is the entire inherited uh, system. So when we talk about canon law, we talk about a legal system that developed out of Roman law and has been maintained for the entire existence of the church, the entire history of the church. And we also can say that our jurisprudence actually dates back to pre-Christian juris, legal jurisprudence of the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. So you'll see canon lawyers citing people like Cicero and Ulpian and Gaius uh, and not just uh, the most recent developments, but obviously there is uh, that as well in our, in our jurisprudence. Uh, so we have a 4,000 year legal jurisprudence, which no other uh, legal body on earth can actually claim which is quite an amazing amount of jurisprudence to, to sift through. Uh, but it is also a really great privilege. And one of the uh, things that excites me about canon law is you dig into these texts, their original Latin texts of these great uh, jurists uh, throughout the past 4,000 years, and, and you see the insights into, into legal systems and uh, structurizations and justice. Wow. wow. Yeah, no, I did not know that. And now can you talk about how that's distinct from doctrine and you know, the, the teachings of the faith? faith and okay, so, yeah, so the law of the church is its own proper legal system. We actually have two main codes. There's the Latin code of canon law, uh, which most of you are familiar with since most people turning in and watching are probably uh, part of the Latin church, uh, sui juris, self-governing. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> All right. That's, that's the Latin code. Then there's the unified Eastern code of canon law, which governs the 23 churches sui juris in the, of the Eastern churches. All right. So there's 23 Eastern churches and there's the one Latin church. All 24. Okay are what we are referring to when we talk about the universal Catholic Church. Not that we're a confederation, but the fact that we are, each of these unique churches are uh, a part of that greater reality of the universal Catholic Church. Right. Makes sense. So now it's, it's my understanding that when it comes to doctrine, faith and morals, that cannot change. But, but when it comes to can canon law can be changed right that is the only point. only parts of it all right so when we're dealing with doctrine uh for instance all right if you were to look in your code of canon law all right and we were to go let's say to <clears throat> canon 998 which deals with the anointing of the sick the sacrament of the sick all right it says very clearly the anointing of the sick by which the church commends the faithful who are dangerously ill to the suffering and glorified Lord in order that he relieve and save them is conferred by anointing them with oil and pronouncing the words prescribed in the liturgical books. All right. Now that is actually touching all upon doctrine. What is the anointing of the sick? Who is it for? Okay. All of that is doctrinal, but it is now codified and expressed in law. All right. Those things can't change, even in law, because it's drawing from doctrine. All right. There are the sources of law. So you have divine revelation, 
all right? So sacred scripture and sacred tradition of which doctrine falls in that realm, okay? Then you, so that's the divine positive law, all right? The divine positive law. Then you have the natural law, all right? A perfect example of the natural law is, for instance, when we talk about marriage and how it belongs to the natural law and not just divine positive law, but that it is a reality within natural law, right? Again, does the church have the authority to change natural law? No, absolutely not. So the only type of law in the church that can actually change is what is called merely ecclesiastical law. Now, this word merely is not a pejorative the way we normally take that sense of merely. Merely in legal language in the church means totally. It's absolutely ecclesiastical law. It's not divine. It's not natural. It's totally and completely ecclesiastical. So that type of ecclesiastical law can change, can be modified. But even with the modification of ecclesiastical law, merely ecclesiastical law, we must remember how much does that merely ecclesiastical law touch upon the divine and the natural? Because if they're touching upon the divine and the natural, then we have to realize that they're bespeaking something that we need to be very careful with. And we can't just take for granted. We can't just uh, play around with willy nilly because law is never meant to be arbitrary because the virtue of justice is never arbitrary. And every single one of our laws in the church are meant to have been discerned very carefully. I mean, if we look at the, like I was talking about that whole history of jurisprudence collected over 4,000 years, right? And then we look at the first time that the law was codified. It went from a corpus to a code, which was the 1917 Pio Benedictine Code, all right? The very first time that that happened, you had the great scholar Gaspari taking from the Corpus Juris Canonici and codifying it and putting it together so it could be a codified uh, code of law. And with that, we have all this collected jurisprudence plus all the doctrinal heritage of the church, that divine law and the, po- and the natural law, all coming together. And you had all these scholars debating, okay, exactly how do we word this? Exactly how do we do this? All right. And that leads us to the 1940s, where Pope Pius XII began the process of a codification of the Eastern laws. All right. This whole venture led uh, Pope St. John XXIII to realize both the Eastern law and the Latin law needs to have a revitalization and and to have a a deeper uh, process of of, uh, examining this law. And that was this, there was two primary purposes, all right, for the Second Vatican Council. The first purpose, which was most important, was the, uh, an, the development of a new code of canon law for both the Latin church and the Eastern churches. And that's why in the, East, the, doc dec, uh, the decree on the Eastern churches, all right, you have the, a pre-code, a pre-code developed, which led to the whole process for codifying the Eastern law. And then you have all these decrees, the decrees on the bishops, the decrees on the formation of the priesthood and the priesthood, all these missionary activities, all of this was a pre-code that was meant to be the foundations for a new code of canon law. 
The second purpose was to develop Christian unity, specifically with the Eastern Orthodox churches, all right, but also to heal the wounds with the Reformation churches, ecclesial communities, all right. And that's why Lumen Gentium is the document par excellence that all the other documents from Vatican II are meant to be uh, interpreted in light of Lumen Gentium. Because that's the ecclesiological document that lays out all the doctrinal framework of what the church is so that we can then move forward with a law that's expressive of that ecclesiological reality for both the unified Eastern Code and a Latin Code. And so after the Second Vatican Council ended on December 8th, 1965, it then became an 18 year long process of the greatest scholarly legal minds in the church throughout the world debating on how do we bring about this new code and you had the brilliance the absolute genius who had doctorates in both sacred theology dogmatic theology and law in uh, Pope St. Paul VI, who really held everything together, both the doctrinal and the legal elements, and masterfully left a, a almost completed work that then you had John Paul II finish with and promulgate in that 1983 Code of Canon Law, and then the 1990 code of Eastern, uh, uh, the Eastern Code of Canon Law. And you have to remember now, Canon Law is not just what's in those two books. It goes way beyond that, all right? So you, the third leg, as Pope John Paul II would say, is, um, is, is the document on the Roman Curia, okay? which is currently looking at being revi revised by uh, Pope Francis, all right? But that apostolic constitution is, 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 is the third leg. And then every single time we deal with proper law, particular law, there's the special law of the Roman Curia, there's, uh, there's the proper law of religious uh, or, uh, institutes, uh, societies of apostolic life and institutes of consecrated life. You ha they have their own proper law. You have particular law in every single diocese. So there's many sources of law, not to mention the prenotanda in each of the different books of the sacraments and their rites, those rituals. All of those form, uh, you know, what is canon law? So you have the two codes, Latin, Eastern, and poster bonus, all right, on the Roman Curia. Then you have the proper, the special law of the Roman Curia. You have all this, the prenotanda in the sacramental books, uh, sacraments and rituals. You have all of this particular law of different churches. It's, it's very, very complex. And, you know, so when we look at the law of the church, we see that it definitely is part, it's taking doctrine such as Lumen Gentium, and in, in regards to the ecclesiology of the church, and it is applying it. So in many, in, in a certain sense, an aspect, not the entirety, but an aspect of canon law is applied ecclesiology, okay? But then we go in canon law beyond ecclesiology, beyond the doctrinal, because we deal with actual uh, processes, administrative and judicial trials. And so there's all the procedural law, all right? And that deals with the virtue of justice and the virtue of truth and how we also apply charity to these things, mercy, where justice and mercy meet, right? But at the same time, these things are expressive of true law, all right? It's a legal system, a full proper legal system with courts and prosecutors and uh, advocates and all the rest. Yeah, so it's so it seems now not because so that's the big reason why it went from 1917 to 1983 to br to bring in the Eastern churches to have one code of canon law for everyone. 
Well, no, 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 no. It, it, there's two separate codes. Okay. It was always intended to have a separate Eastern code to honor the patrimony and traditions and the uniqueness of Eastern law. Gaspari, at, after the 1917 code was promulgated, he wanted to just modify the 17 code and, but, and pretty much thrust the Latin legal tradition upon the Eastern churches. And that was what was somewhat happening in those uh, modu proprio that were issued in the 1940s concerning Eastern law law for the Eastern churches. They really weren't being respected as separate and unique churches, but as a right under the greater umbrella of the Latin church. And that's not really true. They're their own unique churches, sui iuris, self-governing, with their own patrimony, spiritual heritage, traditions, customs, and all of that. And so what Vatican II did, and what John the Twenty-Third was moving toward, that then John Paul II codified in 1990 was the fact that they have their own unique code so that they have their own and so really we actually have two separate and distinct legal systems in the same one catholic church you have the legal system of the latin church and then you have the unified legal system of the eastern churches Okay, okay. And now with everything has to stay consistent, right? The, the doctrine, everything can change. It's, the it's, doctrine it's, can't and natural law can't, but all the merely ecclesiastical laws can be different. And, you know, even in the way that they carry out certain procedures in their trials are slightly different because they're based off of uh, the Eastern heritage of, of, of legal jurisprudence versus the Latin heritage. And then there's also elements of, uh, like even in penal law, for instance, in our penal law, we have two types of penalties, all right? There are medicinal penalties, and we have vindictive penalties, or better known as expiatory penalties, all right? In the Eastern Church, they believe that penal law can only ever be medicinal, so there are no expiatory penalties. All right. Okay. Yet you do have forms of penalties that we feel are contrary to the notion of uh, the, uh, the ecclesiology of the Latin church. So, for instance, you can actually be denigrated in the Eastern church where you are, where you were a priest and now you're denigrated degraded to a deacon now we would say you can't do that because you've received the sacramental character of the priesthood and so you can't be not a priest all right and the east recognizes that as well but you could be degraded down we don't do that we just remove you from the priesthood altogether you are no longer in the clerical state okay all right. So if, you, but that's a, that's a really significant difference in penalties. Right. Yeah, it's a big difference. So now, how bind, <laughs> So now, how binding is it when the when the, when the Pope in an encyclical says something? How binding is that on future popes and councils? How does that? Okay. Work? So we have to understand that there's a real difference in different types of papal documents, right. right? So there's the highest act of governance is legislating, okay? An act of legislation is truly the highest act of governance that you can have. Uh, executive, so legislative document is the most important, all right? An executive document hashes out based on what the law is, it puts the meat on the bones, if you will. All right, how are we going to enforce that law? How are we gonna enact that law? How are we gonna take that law and bring it to fruition? All right, that's an executive document. And then of course there's judicial, all right? But we're gonna put judicial to the side for a second, all right? 
So when the Pope issues a, uh, a document, we have to look at it, all right, well, is he establishing a new law? Is he providing expression to that law? So an executive reality. Is he providing jurisprudence on how to act judiciously? So we got to look at it in that way. So what is he establishing? Is he establishing jurisprudence? Is he establishing expression of how to fulfill a, a, a particular law? Or is he actually establishing law itself? All right. And then we, we can apply that also to something that's doctrinal. So when, when the Pope is issuing something that is de fide catholica et universa, all right, so now we're talking about, okay, he, this is, he's proclaiming doctrine or dogma, all right? All right, so it's an ex cathedra uh, infallible statement here, it's actually an infallible magisterium, you know, well then, now that's a, that's a particular act. That's a very rare and particular act, all right? So when we see something like that, then that is obviously going to have both doctrinal, so how we teach the faith, and legislative realities, okay, because legislation is going to express, like I said, the divine positive law, all right, but when we're talking about the fact that the, uh, the Pope issue, and that would come out in an apostolic constitution, all right, that would come out in an apostolic constitution. Now, the, the particular type of a document, apostolic constitution, doesn't mean that it's doctrine every single time. Uh, whenever there's the erection of a new diocese, that's an apostolic constitution. Whenever there's uh, uh, some sort of major structural advancement, so like Anglicanorum Chetibus that established the Anglican ordinariates, that was an apostolic constitution. All right, so major legislative and doctrinal things will be dealt with by apostolic constitutions. All right, and in cyclical, you have two types. You have dogmatic and pastoral. Notice that I said dogmatic, not dogma. Right, this it's is ordinary. It's not defining magic. dogma. Right. Yeah. It's giving further expression to the dogmas that already exist. But an encyclical is uh, the highest teaching document outside of an apostolic constitution that actually is going to proclaim some sort of a, of a teaching at, you know, in front, ex cathedra or whatnot, all right? right? Then you have the pastoral encyclicals that might actually sometimes have greater authority than a dogmatic encyclical because in the pastoral encyclical, there have been times where the Pope has actually expressed jurisprudence on like how to deal with matrimonial issues, matrimonial jurisprudence, or has actually issued laws de dealing with the pastoral governance of the church. So that could actually be a very, very important document just because pastoral does not mean that it's not of a very uh, high level of authority. Then you have apostolic exhortations, which really are exhorting people to follow what is already in place whereas an encyclical is developing something, an exhortation is restating what has already been expressed. Okay. Apostolic letters could just be a letter to a country or a diocese. If it's given motu proprio, then that is expressing the fact that it's by his own initiative, the Pope's own initiative. And typically motu proprios tend to be used to, ex uh, to bring forth either reforms, or new legislation. Okay. All right. So now, because it would seem that before the council, it would seem that we weren't allowed to pray with non-Catholics. Um, and also, it seems like the understanding of, do we pray to the same God as Muslims and Jews? It, it, would, it would seem like those kind of things, and even, and even looking at Protestants and Orthodox as our brothers and sisters at a supernatural level, it would seem like that has changed. Yes, it. yes, and, and, and though you because uh, attitudes toward um, a, that were contrary toward ec ecumenism were changed. Those were disciplinary changes. Those were changes of merely ecclesiastical law 
or just attitudes. Uh, in some cases, it wasn't the fact that it was law. It was just an attitude that existed within the church. All right. And those attitudes were changed by the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council. All right. But they could. All right. Because we're not talking about something that actually touched it, that, that was doctrinal. We're talking about something that was merely ecclesiastical law or attitudes. Attitudes. And what I mean by attitudes, I mean as unwritten uh, dispositions of people in the church. So not officially law, but just uh, the disposition of people. All right, because it would just seem objective. It would seem like it would be more objective than that. Like either either we're praying to the same God as Muslims, Muslims or we're not. That doesn't seem like it's an attitude. Okay, well, I mean, when we're... When, we have to take the, these things separately, all right? So when we're talking about, first of all, relationships toward the Orthodox Eastern churches, all right? Or are we talking about uh, the Protestant Reformation ecclesial communities? Or are we talking about other religions? And that would then be Islam, Buddhism, all right? So if we're looking at, we got, because we do have to take those differently, and the church addresses those differently. There's the right. difference between Lumen Gentium 15 and then Lumen Gentium 16. That deal, 15 deals with uh, those who are, are validly baptized and it even creates degrees. So you have those who have a valid uh, apostolic secession and therefore a valid Eucharist, such as the Eastern Orthodox and the um, Assyrian Church of the East. All right. And then you would have those reformation communities that don't have a valid eucharist and or apostolic secession episcopate but they would have valid baptism uh, you know so that would then be all those reformation ecclesial communities and so there's different degrees and that's where pope paul the sixth in his encyclical had that ecclesium suam had that really amazing interjection and intervention during the Second Vatican Council that described these relationships as a series of concentric circles at which you have the Catholic Church in the center, all right, but then you have each of these concentric circles of degrees of communion. Because we have to remember one of the important things about Lumen Gentium paragraph eight is that it talks about the church not only in the terms of a perfect society, uh, but also as a communio. So there we see in Lumen Gentium this beautiful imagery of the fact that we see the church uh, analogous to the incarnation of the word of God in the world. All right, and just the way that the word of God becomes flesh. So a spiritual reality is now enfleshed, all right, and now has physical structures. The church, a spiritual reality, now is also a perfect society as well within the world. So it's a communio of faith, sacraments, and ecclesiastical governance, but it also has a juridic uh, figuration. You know, it's, it has this juridic embodiment, and that's where also the which came out actually just about two weeks before the promulgation of Lumen Gentium, you had that nota explicativa previa, uh, which was doctrinal, that came out right before Lumen Gentium that talked about the fact that it, we aren't just a communio, but there is a juridic reality to how we are a communion. All right, okay. within the College of Bishops and within what it means to be communion, that there is this juridic configuration. Okay. So and it's so it's perfect like society and now how does that apply? So yeah, there's these degrees of communion with the church. All right. And we see that all elements of truth and grace that exist outside the visible confines of the church, was, which was already spoken of in the 17th century, the fact that grace and truth could be outside the visible confines of the church. But these urge Catholic unity, as it says in paragraph 13 of Lumen Gentium, 
all right? And then we see what full communion with the church is in paragraph 14. So having the Holy Spirit, so not just being a bump on the log, but being actually animated by the Holy Spirit when we have the communion of faith, of sacraments, and of ecclesiastical governance, that's full communion, all right? Then we have the fact that you have those who have maybe communion of sacraments, all right, by valid baptism, maybe even valid Eucharist, maybe even valid orders, all right? And we see these different grades, if you will, of communion in concentric circles, all right? And then you have the Jews who have that special privilege of actually being considered ecumenical and not interreligious by special privilege and honor because of the fact that 46 of the 73 books of the sacred scriptures are in common with us. You know, Jesus himself was a Jew. Mary was Jewish, you know. So we have that very special relationship with the Jews. And then when it comes to the Muslims, we say, okay, we still have the same one Abrahamic God. All right. We still have that same one Abrahamic God. And so, and then you get into like pantheism and all those other kinds of things after that. And, you know, and polytheism and all that. So there's obviously a series of different degrees of communion with the church. And what we were recognizing was the fact that we need to emphasize these relationships so as to build, because evangelization is reaching out to the common seeds of the word of God, the logos spermaticos that are throughout all creation, and reaching out in a more positive attitude, collegial attitude, and having a colloquium, an actual discussion on the faith, uh, even different faiths, and, and to, uh, uh, to achieve some greater sense of unity doesn't mean compromising our Christian faith. That's how it was first taken, and that was an aberration to true ecumenical dialogue and interreligious dialogue. True uh, dialogue, colloquial, as Paul VI would have called it, is a holding true to our dogmatic heritage, but having a conversation about God, about the virtues of justice, truth, etc., with these people and strengthening unity. All right. So it, w would it confuse people, though, with different degrees of communion than one of the marks of the church being one and saying that we pray for union with, with Orthodox? Is that almost like mentally you start thinking, well, does that mean the church is not one? Well, no. In, in fact, by having this mentality of a communio ecclesiology, we're able to achieve a greater sense of the fact that, okay, we have some degrees of communion, but then there are those elements where, uh, whether it's ecclesiastical governance or maybe an element like the faith, such as, say, the Immaculate Conception, all right, of, well, okay, how, where, where is this differing in, in degrees of communion, of faith, of ecclesiastical governance, etc.? So we can, but that helps us identify, but also have a positive attitude toward it. All right. And if we look at it, communio ecclesiology is deeply rooted in Augustine. And that was the great work of one Joseph Ratzinger to show the origins of communio ecclesiology in the works of Augustine. And he brought that forward. And that's why with Hans Urs von Balthasar and uh, <clears throat> he created the, the brilliant journal academic journal, Communio, which that dealt with scholastics, or is that uh, go along with, is that at odds with the scholastics and Thomism, or does it go not at all? Like, no, no, yeah. no, no. Even if you look at Thomas, all right, he talks about. I mean, look at the 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 heavenly communion of the all right. So we have the communion and of heaven. We have the com communion of here, those of us in purgatory, those in purgatory, and those here on earth. So there's this whole communion, right? And then you have the, the choirs of angels, right? And, and all their ranks and all of that. So this whole concept of communion is stamped deeply upon. Uh, and, and look at the word communion. Com, com with, unity. Communion. 
All right. So if we're going to say, well, the, the mark of the church won, well, communion. Absolutely. The church, by its, by, I, I would actually say that it would be what would be called an essential principle of the church is that it is united. But I would even go beyond that. I would even say that when we take this whole concept of communio ecclesiology as expressed in, say, Canon 205, and in Lumen Gentium 14 of the communion of faith, sacraments, and ecclesiastical governance, that those things are constitutive elements of the reality of the church. So a constitutive element is the sine qua non, all right, of a res, of a thing, all right? So it is that without which that res, that reality, ceases to be that reality, all right? So I would actually argue that, you know, the co communion of faith, of sacraments, right? The, these, all seven sacraments, these are constitutive elements of the reality of the church, all right? And, and the fact that the church is a communio, I would say, is a constitutive reality. I would even say that the fact that the church is a perfect society is a constitutive reality. Because once we take away that, then we no longer really have the church. Okay. Okay. Because it's, it seems like what the mentality a lot of people would have taken into it, they've read the Roman Catechism and basically it breaks it into four different groups, very rigid categories. You're Christian, infidel, heretic slash schismatic, or excommunicated. You're one of those four. And it seems like that mentality might seem like too much of a closed door to everyone else. Like you're with us or you're against us. Which, yeah, and you, and you see, that, that expresses that attitude of um, the fact that there was just this negative attitude toward um, other faiths and, 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 and traditions and stuff like that. And that was gotten rid of, because remember, the two primary purposes of the Second Vatican Council was to create a new code of canon law, one for the Latin church and one for the unified Eastern churches, and to, and to bring about Christian unity, to strengthen and bring about, effect Christian unity. So the Second Vatican Council strove for developing attitudes toward Christian unity, all right? And you can't, I, I, even when we look at you know, what heresy is, all right? So when we look at Canon 770, all right? Knows him off the top of his head. <laughs> Hold on, uh, sorry. It's 750, sorry. Okay. Canon 750, all right? A person must believe with divine and Catholic faith all those things contained in the word of God written or handed on, that is, in the one deposit of faith entrusted to the church, and at the same time proposed as divinely revealed either by the solemn magisterium of the church or by its ordinary and universal magisterium, which is manifested by the common adherence of the Christian faithful under the leadership of the sacred magisterium. Therefore, all are bound to avoid any doctrines whatsoever contrary to them. Okay. So that's... 750, paragraph 1. Now let's look at Canon 751. Heresy is the obstinate denial or obstinate doubt after the reception of baptism of some truth which is to be believed by divine and Catholic faith. So, heresy is only that which pertains to Canon 750, paragraph 1. Canon 750, paragraph 2. Each and everything which is proposed definitively by the magisterium of the church concerning the doctrine of faith and morals, that is, each and everything which is required to safeguard reverently and to expound faithfully the deposit of faith is also to be firmly embraced and retained. Therefore, one who rejects these propositions which are to be held definitively is opposed to the doctrine of the Catholic Church. But they're not a heretic. Heresy only applies to Canon 7, that which is taught by the um, divine and Catholic faith, all right, in a, and is proposed as divinely revealed by the solemn magisterium of the church. So either by an act ex cathedra of the Pope 
or by an ecumenical council. That is pertaining to Canon 751, 750 paragraph one. That is heresy. That which is, so that is de fide catholica et divina. All right, if you renounce that, obstinately deny or doubt after baptism, then that's heresy, okay? But if you are uh, doubting or denying something that is part definitive by the magisterium of the church, but it's not solemn, and it's not the fact that it is considered divine in Catholic faith, then even though you might be a bad Catholic, you're not a heretic. So we have to look at the fact that there's the de fide catholica et divina, and then there's de fide tenendum. De fide tenendum is what we call seven, canon 750 paragraph two, all right? So a lot of things that we might hold very, very important might only be de fide tenendum and not de fide catholica et divina. Okay. And so... And then now that would weaken denial or doubt of either of these two sections, Canon 750, paragraph one or paragraph two, would definitely weaken your communion of faith with the church. But only the doubt or denial of Canon 750, paragraph one, would make you a heretic. Oh, okay, because in my head, I thought there was a difference between material and formal heresy. Material means... Yes, there is. Material heresy is, I say something that is, by matter of fact, heretical. Formal is now I've been warned by competent ecclesiastical authority, and I remain obstinate, all right? It's the obstinate denial or the obstinate doubt after the reception of baptism of some truth, which is to believe by divine and Catholic faith, 750 paragraph one. Does it have so, to be by ecclesiastical authority or can it just be by another person? It's okay. has, to be by a, has to be by ecclesiastical authority, all right? Because none of us have the authority by virtue of just being ourselves to say you're a heretic, okay? Now, hold on. Hold on, because I see you're ready to jump at the bit. We do have the, spirit, the sense of I am my brother's keeper and uh, the, both the, the corporal and spiritual works of mercy that deal with the fact that we correct those who are uh, erring in the way of sin, okay? So we are called to fraternally correct to fraternally correct, but that has to be done in charity and with mercy, okay? But we also have to remember that only competent ecclesiastical authority have the ability to say this is heresy. Okay. And you therefore, by being obstinate, are a heretic. Okay, so that, okay, that, ma that makes sense. And there has to be a trial because they have a right, because everybody has a right to a good reputation, Canon 221, all right, all right. So you have this right to a good reputation, all right. So you, and you also have a right to due process, all right. You can't be punished. So if we look back in uh, general norms in our Latin code, all right, we see very clearly all right, in Canon 221, paragraph three, that the Christian faithful have the right not to be punished without canonical penalty, with canonical penalties, except according to the norm of law. All right, so which requires a process. All right, there has to be a trial. All right, and, and so you're not going to just be punished and excommunicated uh, for heresy without a canonical process. Okay. 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 I guess I just, and, I just wonder, how do we get people to wake up then? A lot of people who are, like I grew up mostly basically a cafeteria Catholic. I pick and choose what I believe, as unfortunately a lot of members of my family. So how do you? Absolutely. Fraternal correction, preaching, teaching 
All right, that's where if we go back to that section in the 700s, so we go to the teaching of the word of God. All right, so if we go to uh, Canon 747, so it's the, that's the teaching function of the church, book three. So the church to which Christ the Lord has entrusted the deposit of faith so that with the assistance of the Holy Spirit, it might protect the revealed truth reverently, examine it more closely, and proclaim and expound it faithfully, has the duty and innate right, independent of any human power whatsoever, so the government doesn't get to intervene, to preach the gospel to all peoples, also using the means of social communication proper to it. So it's saying that the church has this right to protect the revealed truth, so that which is divine in Catholic faith, right? Canon 750, paragraph one, all right? Divine revelation, scripture and tradition, natural law, all right? All those kinds of things. Then, you know, so we can teach these things. We have the right to protect the revealed truth reverently, to examine it, so to study it, and to expound upon it, all right? So examine it more closely and proclaim and expound it faithfully. Expound it faithfully. So any developments, like a dogmatic encyclical, would expound it faithfully, all right? Uh, a letter from the diocesan bishop to his, parish, to his uh, diocese that is expounding some truth of the faith faithfully all right he doesn't get to just make up the faith all right nowhere here does it say that i can edit the faith that i can add to the faith that i can detract from the faith or that i can reinterpret it no faithfully in accord with the magisterium right so when we have those people who are teaching something that's contrary or are, are picking and choosing like the cafeteria Catholics, all right, here's the opportunity to teach. This is where the teaching function of the church comes in hand. All right? It's not that the church is, is, is um, left spineless uh, these days, but the attitude is instead of just going around and saying, oh, you're condemned, you're a heretic, you said something's off, no, teach them so that they can know the right way, all right? And if they remain obstinate, then we get the ecclesiastical authorities involved, and then we can deal with potentially having to move toward a medicinal therapy, uh, a penalty of excommunication or interdict or something like this, or suspension from ministry, whatever it might be. But does that ever happen? Absolutely. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, how, how often does it actually get elevated to that point? Uh, you know, thankfully, many times it doesn't, you know, when the bishop calls that person in and says, hey, listen, uh, you know, what you're teaching is wrong. And, they, and if they're good and they're pastoral and they're prudent and wise, they're going to know how to, I mean, this is what I learned so uh, wonderfully from my time in Rome when, uh, under uh, Pope Benedict because I was a seminarian and my first two years of priesthood were spent in Rome during the pontificate of Benedict the 16th. And when you look at how he dealt with Skillebex and Hans Kuhn and all these people either as CD, as prefect of the congregation for the doctrine of the faith or as Pope, he he heard their whole argument. He listened. He listened. And then he was so brilliant, he was able to say, well, point 13, subsection A in your argument, you know, you say blah, blah, blah. However, blah, blah, blah. And they were able to have a dialogue, a colloquium, which was the point of Paul VI during the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council. To not have the attitude of just heretic, bye-bye, burn in hell, you know, no. Let's talk. Let's see where you're going wrong away from the faith, where you're straying, and let's have a conversation about it. It's that attitudinal change, which doesn't mean 
that if you are actually going to be a obstinate doubter or denier of uh, that which is divine and Catholic faith, like Leonardo Boff, all right, the CDF came down hard and said, heretic and this, his teaching, all this content that we outline in this document, this is heresy. This is absolute heresy. Anyone who else teaches this is also a heretic. Yeah, All you, right. You would just think so, a lot I of mean, we, and that that is that is actually in very recent years because Leonardo Boff, that whole Boff case was in the 1980s. Yeah. You know, so we're not talking about something that is pre-Vatican II, the the prior attitude we still will come down upon that which is heresy yeah you know but only for the and, and it's it's you got to look at it it's the last resort right you don't turn to penalties in first instance and even our beautiful canon law which i know is just a wonderful thing that like if you're having a, a wonderful day what you should do is you should you should just like cuddle up with the code of canon law and just read it. I'd, I'd do it. <laughs> you know, it, it's just, it's, it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, you know, and, and, and when we, but we, when we look at the code of canon law, we see that penalties are a last resort. Penalties are a last resort. It, it's not like, Oh, well, you know, Let's just jump to a penalty. The, under, in Canon 1341, an ordinary is to take care to initiate a judicial or administrative process to impose or declare penalties only after he has ascertained that fraternal correction or rebuke or other means of pastoral solicitude cannot sufficiently repair the scandal, restore justice, and reform the offender. So it's yep. a last resort. It, it, it makes sense. I just wonder then how come a lot of these, a lot of the governors, people in political office, how come they're, who are professing to be Catholic, how come then they're not being called to the table? It almost, it almost okay. seems like, well, we're giving, we're just going to give everyone a pass because, well, we not at all, dialogue. Not, come, yeah. not at all, not at all. Are all we right. going after them? <laughs> we, there, there's two things that need to be discussed in regards uh, uh, what you just raised. So governors, presidents, prime ministers, uh, people of that sort, all right? Canon 1405, paragraph one. 1405. It is 1405, paragraph gotcha. one, okay? It is solely the right of the Roman pontiff himself to judge in the cases mentioned in Canon 1401 those who hold the highest civil office of a state. That's only the president. That's not the governor. No, governors are a head of state. Remember, governors are heads of state because we actually have states. So we have to wait. So we have to wait until Pope Francis calls out these people. Any head of state, even the secretary of state is considered a head of state. Okay. All right. Can a, so, cardinal, make a, can a cardinal or bishop make a recommendation to the Holy Father how would we, how would we as the absolutely, lady? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, here's the other element. So first of all, you know, uh, Bishop X of Diocese Y can, has the, the pastoral solicitude to that person, all right, because they live within their diocese and they should be issuing uh, some sort of letter, even with a warning and threat, if it is a Catholic uh, person, all right, that like, you know, uh, some sort of uh, restriction or something like that might be having to be placed upon you to protect against scandal and all this kind of thing. All right. But we also have the issue when it comes to politicians, that ultimately you will re render any and all Catholics unelectable in a pluralistic society if you make it that uh, they have to vote exactly along with the Catholic faith. Now, I am not saying 
that they shouldn't. They should, absolutely. And when it comes to something like abortion, I believe that that goes beyond divine law. It's natural law. All right. So it doesn't, you, we don't even have to interject the faith in the abortion issue. Natural law makes this a crime. Okay. You don't have to have any scripture involved. All right. Uh, any faith involved. The natural law shows that this is an abomination. All right. And that it's a violation of the natural law. In fact, if you read um, Justinian's Digest, the first book talks about how abortion is a violation of the natural law, how slavery is a violation of the natural law. And yet the use gentium, the law of nations, has been promulgating laws such as abortion and slavery, contrary to the, nat uh, to the natural law. That's going back to 2,000 years before Christ, they were saying abortion and slavery is, is contrary to the nat natural law. That wow. All right. Mind boggling. All right. So I don't even think you need to interject the level of faith into it. It's a matter of the natural law that this is a violation. All right. Obviously, as people of faith, if we are then also acting in a way that's contrary to divine law, we are violating the divine law. All right. But I'm saying that even those who are not Catholic could say that abortion is a abomination and a, a, a grave injustice because it's contrary to the natural law. So to, the, to get back to your question, what happens is a certain matter of uh, religious liberty, but of the fact that really, not even that it's the fact that if you make it that every single Catholic ha is going to just be rubber stamping what the catechism holds in it for the governance of a secular pluralistic society, that secular pluralistic society is going to stop electing Catholics. And being the fact that the laity are meant to be a leaven to society, we have this tension that exists. It's not good, but it's the fact that there is this tension uh, that, you know, between the fact that, you know, you, you're going to have people who are not going to, are going to render pretty much all Catholics unelectable in society. That's, all right. Yeah. That, that's now, right. you know, and, and so we do have to think about that. All right. Do we, do we make it that we excommunicate Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi and other Catholic politicians like that for their stance on abortion? Or do we have to engage in some other type of pastoral means? And I think that's the difficulty that the uh, bishops, not just here in the United States, but in other countries as well, are, are, are dealing with. They're really dealing with, a, a, you know, so it's, it's not so cut and dry, but I do have good news for you. There is Canon 915. Okay. <laughs> right. So in book four, dealing with the sanctifying function of the church, under uh, the Eucharist, it says, those who have been excommunicated or interdicted after the imposition or declaration of the penalty and others obstinately persevering in manifest grave sin are not to be admitted to Holy Communion. And that's why on, on uh, Sacred Heart Radio, on the Sunrise Morning Show, I addressed the issue of the priest in South Carolina who denied Holy Communion to uh, the presidential candidate, Joe Biden, who is uh, seemingly Catholic. And one of the things that uh, we dealt with here is the fact that he is obstinately persevering in manifest grave sin by his promotion. Because it's not just the fact that he passively, you know, allows Roe v. Wade and uh, 
Planned Parenthood be Casey to to be the you know uh, the reality, but he advocates for it. He advocates for abortion, so he's actually manifesting grave sin in an obstinate fashion. All right. Uh, so by virtue of that, that priest was within his right to protect in that individual instance in his parish to protect against scandal. He had the right to deny Joe Biden Holy Communion. I can't Joe but Biden. Yeah. Joe Biden, because he has not gone under a proper administrative or judicial process to be excommunicated or interdicted, okay, cannot be universally just denied the sacraments. Each pastor has to make the pastoral call that in his parish, it would, make, it would cause scandal for Joe Biden to receive. Because there is not a penalty imposed or declared by administrative or judicial sentence. And he has the right to the protection of his good reputation in Canon 221 and to a process in Canon 221 paragraph three to under because if you're going to penalize him he has a right to a process okay i see I, okay I see, I see what you're saying there yeah so if joe biden comes to my parish tomorrow he's campaigning let's say in northwestern new jersey which he would never be in because i think there's four democrats uh what would wind up happening is I could, and he would, if I, I gave him Holy Communion in my parish, that would cause outrage. I could, I could say, Joe, either you publicly repent of your position on abortion before mass and you, and you make it clear to all these people that you are, uh, you know, going to, re, you know, retract that, or I'm sorry, I can't give you uh, Holy Communion. But, but shouldn't, that makes sense, but shouldn't in practice anyone who knows basically his stance okay even though maybe on the books they, they technically should refuse that well here's the other thing canon 916 says that a person who is conscious of grave sin is not to celebrate mass so as a priest or receive the body of the lord without previous sacramental confession all right unless there is grave reason and there is no opportunity to confess in this case, the person is to remember the obligation to make an act of perfect contrition, which includes the resolution of confessing as soon as possible. All right. So let's say you're knowledgeable of the fact that you committed some sort of a grave sin. All right. It's not publicly known. All right. It's not like uh, you went on a shooting spree and the whole world knows this. All right. It's something that is a cult, an occult sin, a hidden sin. Now, you shouldn't go to communion. So Joe Biden should actually say, all right, I know that my faith teaches that this is a grave sin, what I'm doing. And so I'm going to have the integrity to not go to communion until I go to confession. Now, if confession is absolutely an impossibility before receiving communion, and then you're capable. You're capable of go, making a perfect act of of, commun, of uh, contrition, receiving communion, and then immediately confessing thereafter, because it includes the resolution of confessing as soon as possible. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. And actually, it says. Uh, in, propositum quam primum at one's first at one's first opportunity okay. which is after mass you could go up to the priest and say i need to go to confession okay oh that makes sense i mean we hit on so many good points i got a lot more questions for you let's let's do it let's do it again let's do okay it again. no problem i want to respect your time i know you're a busy man so let's uh yeah if, if thank you very much father phil and it was great great meeting you um i was going to say in person but virtually yeah yeah <laughs> Could, would you please give us a blessing me and my absolutely in nomine patris et filii spiritus sancti amen lord jesus we ask you to bless all of us uh who have listened and engaged in this conversation 
and to help us enrich in ourselves in faith, hope, and, Lord, and, and love, and to grow in a greater love and appreciation for what it means to be a true Catholic, one who is in communion of faith, sacraments, and with our ecclesiastical pastors, our shepherds, so that we might truly manifest that unity and become a light to the world. And we ask this through you, Lord Jesus Christ, and at benedictio de omnipotentis patris fi, et spiritus sancti, descended superbos et mania pro semper. Amen. Thanks, God bless sir. you all. Thank you very much, Father Phil. I appreciate it. Let's, let's do it again. Like I said, I still have quite a bit more for you. Get it. Absolutely. I'd be happy to. <laughs> all right. God bless you, Father. Take God care. Bless. Have a great bye day. Bye. Take care.